Hey there, welcome to Innovate Africa. I'm Kino Cummings and I'll be your host each and every week. What in the world is this show about, you might be asking? Well, let me tell you. It's a storytelling platform. A story about what? Well, it's a story about founders, innovative founders, and their businesses on the African continent that impact people's lives. They've seen challenges on the African continent. They say to themselves, I think I have a solution. As a matter of fact, I think I can be more innovative than anybody else to deliver that solution. And there we go. That's really what the show is about. And it really gives me great pleasure to introduce our next guest. I've been following him for quite some time. Uh, he runs a company called Botale AI, and their business is all about language inclusion. So, Tapelo, I've been wanting to get you in front of a camera behind a microphone for quite some time. And I think first things first, the reason why we're here, and that is the solution that you offer. I always ask businesses, what business are you actually in as Botale AI? So we exist to help businesses engage with their customers in languages that their customers understand and trust using natural language processing. And this allows uh, everyday South Africans and Africans to properly participate in a formal digital economy without having language barriers. Okay, that was a cool explanation, but how can this practically be implemented? Maybe you've got a story that you can share with us. Yeah, I mean, look, in South Africa, for, for example, you can't register a business online if you don't understand English, right? You can't use a banking app in, in a local language. So again, if you don't understand English, you're limited as to what you can do. A very simple example is like my grandmother, and this is, you know, we're part of the inspiration of Botale. So when we started out, she asked me to load prepaid airtime on her phone in Setswana. So she knew exactly what she wanted to do. She could articulate it in Setswana. The instructions are on, are on the voucher, but she couldn't do it because of a language barrier. So that translates into the digital space as well, whether it's through apps, chat, on the phone, um, when businesses engage customers in languages they don't understand, there's a massive problem. Thanks. It makes a lot of sense. The technology side of it, what lies in the back end, is always a tricky thing to talk about, Tapelo. So let's just imagine we had done I know nothing about tech, and you trying to explain to me how Botale actually works from a technology perspective. How, how would you do that? Yeah, no, great question. So... Uh, the AI element in all of this is essentially allowing computers to uh, learn how to use natural spoken language, right? So learning how to hear, which is essentially converting speech to, to text, learning how to extract meaning from the text, learning how to speak, which is usually converting text to speech. So we've got different data sets that we feed to the machine and then it learns relationships between what's uh, what's uh, being fed into it and the intended output, and then it can start producing those. So similar to, um, you know, if, if you were to teach a child how to differentiate between cats and dogs, you can show them pictures of cats and tell them that these are cats, pictures of dogs, these are dogs, uh, feed them a whole, uh, you know, variety of, of such images, and at the end they would learn how to differentiate between the two. So that's how uh, we use machine learning, essentially. Right. Now, in my limited understanding, that is known as supervised learning, right? That's because you're dealing with an annotated data set, or in English, a data set that's been labeled. But I also believe that you get unsupervised learning. Do you use unsupervised learning? H how does that work? Yeah. So supervised learning, unsupervised learning are just different approaches to the learning process. Um, so supervised learning, as you correctly stated, is when you've got a data set that has labels, right? A lot of images of cats and they are labeled cat. A lot of images of dogs, they are labeled dog. You feed an image of a cat into the system, you tell it it's a cat, and it learns from that that, you know, this is cats. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, you just throw in a lot of images of cats without telling it it's, it, it, it's cats, and a lot of images of dogs without telling it it's dogs, and then it learns to uh, differentiate between the two. And then usually you've got an, a, a semi-supervised piece to it where now you bring in labels at the end. Once it's, it's managed to uh, tell the difference between the two, you just say, by the way, those are cats and those are dogs. So usually with this approach, you don't need a lot of um, label data. Generally, a lot more cheaper uh, from a data point of view to, to um, implement. 
I just love the analogy of cats and dogs and trying to explain supervised versus unsupervised, etc. But what about the real world application when it comes to languages? I would imagine it is applicable to languages as well, because you don't only get one type of English, you get different types of English dialects, for example. So how does this all work? Yes, so same principles apply. You've got like uh, supervised approaches to, to language learning. So if we use transcription as an example, you can teach a machine with like uh, speech and the transcription to that speech, and then it will learn the different words uh, that, that exist in that language. Or you can just feed it the speech uh, without the transcription, and then it will learn the different parts of the speech uh, that exist within the language. And then later on at the labeled piece, where you start telling it, oh, actually, when that combination occurs, it's the word cat, uh, or it's the specific word. Um, and then there's another layer to it called um, language modeling, in fact. So with language modeling, you now uh, essentially improve the, the, the parameters in which this thing operates according to a specific language. Next, let's delve into some of the more practical applications. What have you identified? We talk about language inclusion, right? So what have you identified as the best use cases that would benefit you as a business, but also benefit your clients wanting to converse in their customers' mother tongues? Yeah, so we exist mostly in customer care. So we've got two platforms for customer care. The first is a call center analytics tool. So in the call center space in South Africa, you've got uh, calls happening in local languages, non-English. This can go up to like 60% in the financial industry. And you know the call will start off in English, switch to Sotswana, back to English. Um, and existing systems can't deal with that because they weren't trained uh, for that. Or even, even worse, you know, you've got Sotswana with English words or English with Sotswana words. So uh, uh, code switching is, is quite challenging for a lot of systems. So we help um, call centers and businesses that operate call centers to uh, transcribe these calls, regardless of the language happening uh, spoken on the call, regardless of the mixture, and draw insights. So beyond just uh, quantitative insights like call volumes and so on, we can tell you like what's being said. Are there any customer pain points that came out of the, the conversation? Did the agent follow the script? You know. Um, to reduce the, the risk on the business side, but also to protect customers at the end of the day. You know, just because I'm talking to a financial service provider in Sotswana doesn't mean I, should have the same, I shouldn't have the same level of protection, right? So by automating the, the QA process and flagging the calls that are risky, we allow um, uh, the, the customer to be protected, but then also the, the business to reduce their risk. I mean, these businesses are doing millions of calls a month it's, and they only transcribe or analyze less than 3%. So our systems allow these businesses to do up to 100% and then only check the calls that were flagged by the system as, as risky or, or um, yeah, that, that have potential issues. You know, Isabella, as I'm listening to you, um, I'm just fascinated by what this journey must have been like. So to bring everybody into the picture, how long have you been around? And tell us a little bit about the journey that got you to where you are today. So we've been around since 2020, so like COVID babies. Uh, so that's when we started building. And then we spent about the first 18, 24 months uh, collecting data, building the models. And then we've only more recently started commercializing and building that side of the business. It is, you know, a resource um, intense uh, business, you know, training the models, getting the data and all of that. Um, yeah, so now we're in market. We've got some some corporates using our, our, our tech. We've got smaller businesses using our, our technology as well. Excellent. Thank you for that. One of the biggest motivations behind me launching the show is to make sure that I can connect businesses like yours to other businesses, potentially investors, etc. So what exactly are you looking for? Are you looking for capital? Are you looking for people who can help you train models? There's so many nuances in all of this, and you've got tons of needs, I'm sure. So let's unpack some of them. So I think firstly, I'll, I'll, I'll just say, um, we, you know, we're, we're not building AI for the sake of AI. We are solving real problems problems that businesses and people on the continent are, are, are affected by. So what we need actually, or what we want is to get the solution out there. So 
we'd rather have um you know uh, paid pilots and and um uh, uh, proof of values with with businesses before we even get investment because we really back our, our product and solution that much um so that's the first thing i'd say we're looking for but I, I, on the other hand you know in order for us to grow as quickly as as we'd like and to to make the impact we'd like we are looking for for investment generally an invest an investor who has ideally worked with with uh, deep tech not it doesn't have to be ai but an investor who appreciates and understands the resources and the amount of work that has to go into building a solid ip like this um and then secondly someone who um can help us get the solution to the people again we're not building ai for the sake of ai we want to get the solution into businesses in people's hands so that uh, people can really start participating in in the formal digital economy yeah so for me it's very difficult to sort of box portale because you definitely go across industries you're industry agnostic and as long as people are communicating with customers portale is relevant. What about things like education, for example? Education's a big one. I remember a guy called William Smith, I'm giving my age away, and he actually made me understand maths. Um, what about healthcare and, and, and those applications? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, what, what we're doing is allowing machines to understand uh, the, the engagement, right? So the, the language component. So whether that's in healthcare, education, um, you know a bank it's it's the same technology right and yes we might not necessarily necessarily be in those spaces currently but we hope to empower other innovators who better understand uh those industries like like education and mathematics you know there's a particular way in which you teach those those subjects and in which you answer that and we don't know much about teaching uh mathematics so in in instances like that um you know an organization can come to us and say, okay, I want to plug into some of your tools to enable this to happen. And we've had people do that for, for language learning, right? To build a system like Duolingo. We don't know much about teaching people language. We can teach machines language. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you teach a, a, a personal language, right? Do you start with body parts? Do you start with greetings? Do you start with phrases that they use every day, right? And what do you teach them next? But our technology can enable the, the automated learning process where we tell you, okay, read this word, and then the system transcribes it and checks how well you read it, and then it can tell you whether it was correct or not. Or the text-to-speech reads out a, a phrase in that language, and you're supposed to type it down, and then we compare the two in, in the back end. So we really can operate in multiple um, sectors. In healthcare, for instance, um, language is a big thing, right? You're in front of a doctor who doesn't speak um, Isikosa. And that's the only language you understand. So you speak your language, we can transcribe, translate, the doctor can read or even hear what you said. So having a full speech to speech translation and really ensuring that everyone understands what's being said and that no one is, is lost in translation. But yeah, in those instances, we work with people who have deep expertise in those spaces and we just empower them. Tapelo, and I can just imagine being a smaller business, listening to all of these fancy things going, this is probably quite prohibitive for me. But knowing you, you guys tap dance very smartly. I would imagine that you've got tiered pricing, or maybe I'm wrong. How do you deal with different levels of businesses wanting to use Botlale? No, no. So generally, our pricing will scale based on, on volumes. So that allows even smaller, medium-sized businesses to work with us because their volumes obviously will be around the size of their business compared to larger enterprises uh, where the volumes are in the millions. So we base our pricing based on the needs of the customer. If you're only interacting with 100,000 customers, the package will be tailored for your volumes. If it's a million customers, it's tailored for, 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 for the volumes. But generally, it's a, you know, um, depending on the solution you take, we'll have a, a, set, a setup fee for your specific business because everything is tailored for your business whether it's the language you used for your business the style the, the the tone and so on and then after that we've got a monthly subscription based on volumes and features because we've got analytics and so many other things on our platforms um, you can pick and choose what you want now it's been a phenomenal chat i think in closing what i'd like to know from you there might be young people at the start of their careers 
all trying to figure out what they do. Maybe they're dabbling in entrepreneurship. Maybe it's someone who's just started a business. You've walked quite a long road. What are some of the key lessons that you can share with aspirant entrepreneurs and people who want to be like you? you know, I'd say, you know, get get started, get validation as quickly as possible without spending much. So find ways, creative ways in which you can validate that the problem actually exists and leave the tech, right? So with us generally right now, um, AI is just the way in which we do what we do, but what we do comes first and the problem we're solving comes first. So really obsess about the problem and find a way to validate that problem without necessarily worrying about the tech. The tech will come later. Um, and and so that's that's the one piece of advice because generally people spend too much time worrying about this that they forget this part. And then they spend like eight months, 10 months building this piece and then realize that the problem doesn't exist. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And another, one, one or two other bits? Uh, I think another one is generally, you know, as, as you're growing in this space, you face like a lot of imposter syndrome, um, which is a very difficult thing. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's important to believe that, you know, when you're in a certain space, you deserve to be there, right? It's not by, by, by chance. It's not by accident that you're there. Um, so really show up um, to, to the best of your, your abilities. I think uh, uh, there's a, I can't remember if it's a poem or the, the man in the arena, um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. You know, it's not, it's not the critic that counts. It's the man in the arena who knows that, you know, through blood, sweat and tears that um, whether you lose or win at least you did so daring greatly you know so really show up um, because not a lot of people can put themselves in that space where you feel like an imposter but the mere fact that you are there and you're standing up is like it's it's yeah it's it's a lot Tapelo, I know you're a busy man. Thank you very much for taking the time. I'll do some follow-up interviews with you to find out what Portale is busy with down the line, but hopefully we can connect you as well. And that really is what Innovate Africa is all about. It's about telling those stories of innovators who impact lives, yes, but it's also about creating a collaborative community to help each other accelerate you might be a corporate needing a botlale, or botlale might need you as a corporate, or you might be an investor, or you might have a call center. It's about connecting everybody and making sure that we don't work in silos and that we actually collaborate to innovate. I'll see you next week.